Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 will be in verses 27 through 30, primarily this morning, looking at the second teaching that our Lord Jesus Christ gives us on the law. He's giving a teaching that was lacking from the teachers of Israel in his day. And so he's giving clarification. He's giving the full counsel of God. He's giving the truth from the Old Testament that was lacking in the teaching of the day when he shows up on the scene. And so I'm going to read Matthew 5, 27 through 30, and then we'll pray. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. But if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off. And throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, again for your word. Thank you for the strength to comprehend it, for the understanding of it by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the sermon preached by your Son, Jesus Christ. God himself, speaking to us this morning, we're dependent on you, we're dependent on your spirit to accomplish your work in us this morning, and we're thankful that we can be confident that you will do your work. And so we ask and we look forward to what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've been talking these last number of weeks about the Old Testament for quite a while now because Jesus talks about the law and the prophets. And I've told you before that the law and the prophets, the way to understand the Old Testament, the key book to understanding the Old Testament is the book of? Come on, Deuteronomy. Okay, I heard it, I heard it. The book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the key to understanding the whole Old Testament, both the law and the prophets. It's the link in between that. And so this morning, I want to give us a little time on the front end of the sermon, and we'll tie this together at the end, but I want to look at the book of Deuteronomy. So turn to chapter 5, if you would, if you have your Bibles with you. I'm going to read a little bit extensively from chapter 5. Then I will read some excerpts of the remainder of Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy, the name sounds weird, right? Deuteronomy, what does that mean? Deutero being two or second, and namas means law. So this is the second law. Now, is it any different than the first law? No, it's no different. It's the second giving of the law. There's nothing new being taught in Deuteronomy. It's just a second emphasis on the law. By the way, that's similar to the Sermon on the Mount. There's nothing new being taught in the Sermon on the Mount. It's another giving of the law. Isn't that interesting? But this is Moses preaching a sermon by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it's scripture, it's God speaking. But this is Moses preaching a sermon to the people of Israel. They're on the cusp of entering the promised land. They've been wandering for 40 years. And those generations that refused to go in, the adult generations, have now passed on. And the kids have now grown up. And they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. And Moses is not allowed to go in. He is going to die for, for, for embarrassing, in a sense, or for not glorifying God before the people of Israel, not treating God as holy when he struck the rock, when he was told to speak to the rock. And so he is restricted from going into the promised land. So he's giving kind of his last sermon, his last charge to the people before he goes on the mount and dies. And they will go on without him. 
That is the second giving of the law. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and, and then there's the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to read the Ten Commandments just for sake of time this morning, but I'll pick it up after the Ten Commandments in verse 22. So verses 1 through 5 of Deuteronomy 5. Then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them. And be careful to do them. Yahweh our God cut a covenant with us at Horeb. Yahweh did not cut this covenant with our fathers, but with us. With all those of us alive here today. Yahweh spoke to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. I was standing between Yahweh and you at that time to declare to you the word of Yahweh. For you were afraid because of the fire. It did not go up the mountain. And then he gives the Ten Commandments in verses 6 through 21. And now let's go to verse 22. These words Yahweh spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, from the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the dense gloom, with a great voice. And he added no more. He wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. Now it happened that when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness... While the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, Behold, Yahweh our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he lives. So now then, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of Yahweh our God any longer, then we will die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? As for you, go near and hear all that Yahweh our God says. Then speak to us all that Yahweh our God speaks to you and we will hear and do it. And Yahweh heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And Yahweh said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments all the days, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. Go, say to them, return to your tents. But as for you, stand here by me. That I, may, that I may speak to you all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess. So you shall be careful to do just as Yahweh your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. In all the way which Yahweh your God has commanded you, you shall walk, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess." I hope you can hear the weightiness of that text, the seriousness of that meeting at Mount Sinai. I hope you can, you can hear the fear, really, in the people, the reverence for God as he gives them the law. And Moses reminds them of all of this and reminds them of the response of God to them in the giving of his law. And Moses goes on to preach, and I want to read a few excerpts from the beginning of his sermon. So I'm going to do that. I'll just give you the passage and read it. If you want to try to follow along, that's fine. If you want to just listen, that's fine too. Chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words, which I'm commanding you today, shall be on your heart. Chapter 7, verses 7 through 9. Yahweh did not set his affection on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers. Yahweh brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
You shall know, therefore, that Yahweh your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Thus you shall know in your heart that Yahweh your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. So you shall keep the commandments of Yahweh your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Now over in chapter 10, verses 12 through 15. So now, Israel, what does Yahweh your God ask from you but to fear Yahweh your God, to walk in his ways and love him? And to serve Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to keep the commandments of Yahweh and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today for your good. Behold, to Yahweh your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did Yahweh set his affection to love them. And he chose their seed after them, even you above all peoples, as it is to this day. Chapter 11, verse 1. You shall therefore love Yahweh your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments all your days. Same chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. And it will be that If you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love Yahweh your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that I, Yahweh, will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and late rains, that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil. Then the same chapter, chapter 11, 22 and 23. For if you are careful to keep this entire commandment which I am commanding you to do, to love Yahweh your God, to walk in all his ways and to cling to him, then Yahweh will dispossess all the nations from before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. From chapter 12 through a whole bunch more, then there's a retelling of other portions of the law And then we could go to the end of Deuteronomy, the last few chapters, and see once again many verses like I just read to you. But I'm going to stop there. I think you get the point. In fact, let me bring out five points that I just read to you, five points that Moses makes to the people of Israel that are very important. First of all, point number one, God set his affection and his love on Israel. He chose Abram. That's point number one. He chose Abram. And he set his love on his descendants. Point number two is, Israel was to know that they did not deserve it. That it wasn't something Abram worked out in himself that made him attractive to God. That it wasn't that the people would be attractive to God. No, they did not deserve it. But God chose them of his own volition, of his own will, of his own choice to make them his people. Number three, God demonstrated his love for them through the redemption of bringing them out of Egypt, bringing them through the wilderness, and now he is going to bring them into the promised land. God has shown them his love by delivering them from Egypt in slavery and bondage with an outstretched arm, with a mighty and strong hand. So they were to know that he chose them, that they did not deserve it, that he demonstrated his love for them in their redemption out of Egypt. Number four, that God gives them his law, and that it is an act of love that God has given them the law. That God has given him his law, given them his law because he loves them. That's why he gave them the law. It's an act of love. The law is a law, really, of love, of God's love expressed to his people. And number five is that their response to that is to obey God. And be devoted to God. But more than that, did you hear it so many times? To love God. To love God. God desired with Israel a relationship of love. 
Yes, he is their God, and they needed to understand he's God Almighty. He's worthy of obedience, but he desires a relationship with his people of love. I have demonstrated my love to you. Now love me in return. And if you love God, you're devoted to him. You're obedient to him. Now fast forward in Israel's day. They're now in the land. They've been in the land. Then they've been out of the land. And they're back in the land again. And Jesus steps into the scene. And it has become all about duty. And the idea of love has pretty much disappeared from the land of Israel. The idea of loving God is scarce within Israel. It's not taught. Rather, what's taught is be submissive. Do your duty before God. And they are teaching laws, but they aren't, we're going to see this morning again, they're not teaching the full counsel of God. They're not teaching all the law of God. And this is where we find ourselves in Deuteronomy chapter 5. I just want to make sure you have that background, and we'll tie that together later. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Some of you say, I already know where you're going. That's okay. Just don't get ahead of me. Wait for me. But now we're in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30, and let me just read 27 for you. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. If you remember, there are six of these where you have heard it said, or you may have heard it said, or the ancients were told. And then Jesus follows that up by saying, but I say to you, six of those. This is the second one. Last week we were in number one, which was on murder and how anger and murder are the same thing, the same sin. And this week, what have they heard said? What have they heard taught? What's being taught? You shall not commit adultery. That's a good teaching. I tell you this morning... You shall not commit adultery. That's a good teaching. There's nothing wrong with that teaching unless it ends there, (laughs) unless it stops there. The the Pharisees, the scribes, are teaching, that's it. If you have not committed adultery externally, done the act, you're guilt-free. You're righteous. That's what the Pharisees And the scribes would declare. So they would consider themselves righteous. They would consider themselves right with God. They have obeyed the seventh commandment. Last week was the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. This week is the seventh commandment. And I believe there's a flow to how Jesus goes through these six. And we'll see that as we work our way through. Last week was the sixth. This week he jumps to the seventh. He goes to the next commandment. And last week he fleshed out what it meant to not murder. Now this week he will flesh out what it means to not commit Adultery, And we will see in a moment that adultery can be expanded beyond just sexual intercourse between a a married person and someone else. That it can be expanded beyond that. Jesus is going to expand that. In other words, what is adultery or what is the sexual sin is any sexual activity outside of the confines of a biblical marriage, of a God-ordained marriage, of a marriage between one man and one woman who are one flesh for life. And any sexual activity outside of that is sexual immorality. It's breaking this commandment, as we'll see in a moment. All of that. And that's not popular to say in our culture, is it? Not popular at all. You know, I mean, people like to do a lot of different things in this area, don't they? And when you try to restrict sexual activity to just the marriage, people recoil against that. Because they are doing it, because they enjoy it, because they feel judged and they feel condemned. But we ought not to back away. We don't, we don't go to God's commands and try to reinterpret them through the culture. We interpret them as God says to them. We pull them out of the text, don't we? And then we apply it to the culture. We apply the word to the culture. We don't bring the culture into the scripture And so all sexual activity outside of the confines of a marriage, which is one man and one woman, one flesh, for life, all other sexual activity is sin. It breaks this command. What were the scribes and Pharisees? What's wrong with that? If the scribes and Pharisees were even held to that, what's wrong with it? It's interesting. They they would teach that lust is not a problem, 
that desiring someone, imagining someone, doing it in your mind, that's not a problem. That's fine as long as you don't act on it. If you don't act on it, you're righteous. You can think it. And you know what? Judaism still holds to that today. They don't believe that lust is a sin. Recently, Dennis Prager, I don't know if you're familiar with that, and he said some controversial things on pornography, and we'll talk about that in a moment, what he said, but, but he said some controversial things about pornography. He's a Jew, he's a Jewish man, and, and he said that, that lust is not a sin. I'm not picking on Dennis Prager. I think he does some good things for conservative causes, but he's not a Christian. In fact, he would condemn these words of Jesus. He's like, I can't believe Jesus would actually mean what he said there. I heard him say that, okay? And I mean, he's, he's not an enemy in the sense of the church, but he is because he's not in Christ, right? He's an enemy of Christ. If he's not in Christ, I don't care if he's Jewish or not, he's an enemy of Christ. That's what the Bible would say. We're going to go with the Word of God, okay? And I know he wouldn't set himself up as an enemy of Christ, but the Word of God would say he is, and we need to hold to the Word of God. But Judaism teaches lust is not a problem. That's what they were teaching here. Lust is not a problem. Don't worry about it. As long as you don't act on it, as long as you don't reach out and touch her, you're fine. Don't worry about it. If you have not committed the act, you're righteous. You're righteous. And Jesus is going to fill up that teaching, isn't he? He's going to give us the true teaching. Because the scribes and the Pharisees and Judaism, and by the way, all mankind does this. We take God's standard, which is way up here, and can we attain it? I can't. I cannot attain it. So what do we do with God's standard? Let's bring it down a little bit. Let's, let's bring it down a little more because I can't get to that one. Oh, let's bring it. You know, I maybe can get over this one. That's the new standard. And that's what the Jewish people are doing. They're taking God's standard and they're bringing it down and bringing it down and bringing it down until they come to a place where they can say, now I can get over that standard. So let's make that the new standard and then I can be righteous because I've met the standard. Look, it doesn't matter whether you meet man's standard or not. You've got to meet God's standard of righteousness. That's the only standard that matters. No other standard, no man-made standard. If you get over a man-made standard, you've done nothing to please God. It is his standard and his standard alone that we hold to. And so Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I want to break down and say a little bit more about the but I say to you. I thought about this in light of the fact that, that Jesus, um, as he's teaching his disciples here, his disciples probably do not yet know the fullness of who Jesus is. He, he's a great teacher. He's different than what we're experiencing we're following him. We're going to be faithful to this teacher, but, you know, they don't, I don't think yet know who he is, that he is God, that he is the Messiah. They don't know the fullness just yet, but Matthew is writing to the early church, and guess what? The early church, they know who Jesus is. Matthew is writing to us. Do we know who Jesus is? He's God. When Jesus says... But I say to you, so many have said, see, this is a new teaching. Jesus is giving something new. He is not, yeah, we're going to see in a moment, he's not giving you anything new. Jesus was there when the law was given. Jesus was there when the law was given. He's God, eternal God. He's not bringing forth something new. He's teaching the whole council. He's teaching the entire word of God. And when Jesus says, but I say to you, what you can take to the bank is, this is what God says. This is what God says. When Jesus says, but I say to you, it's not just a good teacher, it is what God is saying to us. And we must understand that. Every time he says, but I say to you, we should hear, this is what God says. Man lowers the bar, but God says the bar is up here. The bar is up there someplace, you know, because up here I can touch it. I can't touch the standard of God. I can't touch his righteousness. It's so high above me. I can't, I can't attain to it. There's no chance. It's that far above me. And so God says, Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman or everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her 
has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, ladies, I know that there is men in view in this text, but you are not off the hook. (laughs) This goes both ways. The sin of lust is not exclusive to men. You may say maybe it's primarily expressed by more men than ladies, and that may be some truth to that. Maybe ladies are just better at hiding it. It exists in all mankind. There is no exemption from the sin of lust. We have all struggled with it. I'm confident of that. I don't think there's anyone here who could say, I'm righteous in this area. I doubt it. And maybe if somebody wants to argue with me, I don't want to argue with you. I'm just telling you, this is a sin that is common to man. And it's, ladies, I understand that Jesus has men in view because that's who he's teaching. But you're not off the hook. You are liable for the same thing if you are guilty of it. And the word looks, if anyone who looks at a woman, that, that word means to take notice of. I want you to understand it's not sinful to look at somebody. It's not even sinful to look at somebody and say, that's an attractive person. Let me ask you, did God make beauty in the world? Yes, he did. In fact, we ought to look at almost every, we ought to look at every individual and say, made in the image of God. You know, some people like to buy America, so if we're made in the USA, right? When we look at every person, we just say, made by God. Made by God, image of God. And because of that, they have value. And you may say, well, they're not as attractive as this other person. I understand that. You know, my wife, I'm sorry, guys, but my wife's the most beautiful woman in the world. It's just the way it is. You know, I got her. You're going to have to get the leftovers, you know, and I hope you feel that way about your wife as well, right? We should all feel that way about our spouses. Um, but... We should think every time we look at a person made in the image of God, beautiful, right? That's not wrong. I see beautiful people in front of you. You all are beautiful to me. Why? Because you're made in the image of God, and plus, many of you are my brothers and sisters, and I know you, and I love you, and I care for you. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. It's not wrong to look at someone, or I'd have to stand here and do this, you know? No, it's it's perfectly acceptable to look. And he says, to look at a woman. Now, Jesus did not say, he could have said, to look at a married woman. And if you go to the earlier part, he did not say anyone who's married looks at a woman. In other words, this broadens it out. This is anyone who's married or unmarried who looks at a woman who is married or unmarried, or vice versa, a man or a woman, married or unmarried, who looks at a man or a woman, married or unmarried. And we know in today's culture, it goes every direction, doesn't it? And that's that sin, I'm sorry, but we, we have made sometimes some sins way far worse than others, haven't we? And we would say, well, a man that lusts for another man, that's wicked. And But we'd allow a, ma- a man to lust for a woman all day long. It wouldn't bother us. No. It's sinful in all directions. It's sinful in every direction. We need to understand that. This look is not just a look for the purpose of, of just glancing and noticing, of saying, I appreciate how God makes beautiful people, and we can do that. This is a lingering look. And Jesus says it's for the purpose of lust. Anyone or everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her. What's it mean to lust for someone? The word is epithemeo. That's the key word to understand, to understand what's going on here. The word, the Greek word is epithemeo. It means to long for. And by the way, you know, usually we, we use the word lust, and we'll use it always in a negative context, won't we? I mean, oh, they're lusting. Well, we need to understand the word here in the Greek is not always a negative context. In fact, let me give you a couple other scriptures where this word is used. Matthew 13, 17, Jesus told his disciples, For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired, or epithemeo, to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The Old Testament saints, they wanted to see Christ. They wanted to see the Messiah, and you're privileged to see it. Was it wrong for them to want to see the Messiah? Absolutely not. It was a good epithemeo. It was a good desire. They longed for it. Luke 22, 15, Jesus said to his disciples, I have epithemeo. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He earnestly desired for that last supper to set up that Ordinance of communion. He earnestly desired that. Same word. Luke 16, 21, Lazarus 
epithemeo. He longed to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Remember the poor man, Lazarus? He saw those crumbs, and he's like, I just, I just if I could just take the crumbs from the table. And he longed for them. Same word. None of those are wicked, right? None of those are wrong. Those, it was perfectly right for Lazarus to wish he had the crumbs from the table. He wasn't trying to steal it off the table. He just wanted what was underneath. What was a waste anyway. And those Old Testament saints, what they longed for was a wonderful thing. Jesus longing for the Passover was good. This can be used in a good context and in a sinful context. And here, it's in a sinful context. Why? Because this one you desire does not belong to you. This one you long for does not belong to you. It's not yours to have. And you're looking at them saying, I wish I could have them. I, I would love to have them. I wish I could. I'm imagining what could happen. It's interesting. Paul writes in Romans 7, 7, For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not epithemeo. You shall not lust. You shall not covet. Wait a minute. Paul uses this word epithemeo to describe the law. The tenth commandment. You shall not covet. What is Jesus doing here? He's saying, look, you, you think you're keeping the seventh commandment and you're breaking the tenth. As I said earlier, Judaism teaches lust is not a problem. Remember what, back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter Chapter 5 and Exodus chapter 20, the law is given. Do you remember the first thing God said? You shall not covet what? Your neighbor's wife. They negated that. They threw it out. And they said, it's okay to covet your neighbor's wife. Or maybe they would legalistically say, as long as she's not your neighbor's wife, or as long as she's not somebody's wife, you can covet all day. Either way, they, they negated the 10th commandment, didn't they? They held up the 7th and negated the 10th because they would hold up man's traditions over God's law over and over and over again. How terrible. How terrible to nullify one commandment and claim we're righteous, claim we're being righteous. What does it mean to look at someone with lust, I would tell you that this includes what we do in our imagination, whether it's a real person or a fictional character or someone you do not know, whether it's in a book, whether it's on a phone, whether it's in a movie, whether it's in a commercial. You know, I recently had conversations about somebody, and somebody brought up a point about pornography. It's everywhere. It is so easily accessible. You know, you go back 50 years, and, and if a kid were to look at pornography, it's very easy to get caught, because he's got to have something physical to look at. And it's very, you gotta, you gotta, how do you hide that? You know, I mean, under a mattress, and mom looks under the mattress, you're caught. But today, kids can jump on their phone, and adults can jump on their phone, or their, their iPad, or their computer, and boom, there it is. I tell you, I don't look for it, and sometimes you can be scrolling, and there's something that's pretty porno pornographic, right? You can be watching a football game, and on comes the commercial. And the commercials are pornographic today. We, it's, it's everywhere. Some think pornography is a victimless crime. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's just me and the screen. It's just, well, that ignores so much. It ignores the trafficking the sex trafficking trade, you don't know where that person that you're looking at has how they've gotten there. It ignores trafficking even of children. It teaches people to objectify one another, that we become objects to be used rather than people made in the image of God. And, 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 and let me tell you, it will change your mind on how you view people. Pornography will change your mind on how you view people. Men, if you look at pornography enough, it's going to change your mind on how you view women, including your wife, but it'll change your mind. You will begin to see them as objects and not people made in God's image. Women, same thing. You look at pornography and it will renew your mind. Why do you think the scripture calls us to renew our mind? Because we so badly need it renewed, don't we? Why do you think it calls us to think on these things whatsoever things are true and lovely? Why? Because these things are always out there to warp our mind and we have to have our mind renewed to scripture over and over and over again, don't we? 
There's so much out there that's coming against us. But for the Christian, I, I, don't, I should not have to label all the dangers of pornography. There's more. I just touched on a few. But I shouldn't have to label them. Why? Because when God gives you his law, when God gives you his law, it's a law of love for you. He loves you. And we ought to hear his law and say, then if that's what you say, God, that's best. That's best. That's what I want. You know better than I do. So even if you're not convinced it's a crime that has victims, including you're victimizing yourself to some degree, then at least lay yourself at the feet of God, humble yourself before God and say, you know better than I do. And we need to remove this sin from our lives. Jesus here is teaching the true standard of righteousness. The true standard of righteousness. That it's not enough to not commit the act. That's not enough. You cannot do the act, but that's not enough. That's not the full standard of righteousness. Righteousness requires losing the desire. Wow. Righteousness requires losing the desire for sin. Now that is a high standard, isn't it? That is a high bar. That's a bar that I think I struggle to attain. I'm just being honest. I struggle to attain to that bar. Yet, that's the bar of righteousness. It's to not even want to do the sin. Why? Because remember what God's righteousness is? God's command and God's character. Does God have a desire for sin? That is his character. The standard of righteousness is to have no more desire for sin. And all of us said, I give up. <laughs> right? I mean, no desire. I have desire. I might be fighting the desire. I might be struggling against desire, but I still have the desire. Yeah, don't you realize just how sinful you are? Have you not grasped yet how sinful you are? I don't know that we've ever really grasped the depths of our sin. It's not enough to know God said, do not covet. We've got to lose the entire desire for that. It's not enough to just know the law. We have to do the law. We have to meet that standard of righteousness. You know, Jesus here is teaching that the act of adultery is much more than the act. It's much more than that. In fact, you could argue that adultery is a symptom. Sexual immorality acted upon is a symptom. Let, let me give an illustration of that. You have a friend who develops a cough, and that cough goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe goes into months, you're concerned for your friends, so eventually you say, get to a doctor. Go get this cough checked out. And they go to the doctor, and the doctor sends them to a specialist, and it comes back, and their lungs are full of cancer. Now, the doctor says, this is a treatable type. It's going to be rough, but we need to treat it now. Isn't that what would happen if it was treatable? Now, the cough... It's not a good thing, right? But it's just the symptom of a deeper problem. It's just the symptom of something else going on. A cough is a terrible thing. I've had coughs that lasted for a couple of weeks. Why am I still coughing? Praise God, they weren't more than that. But in this case, the cough is just the symptom of what's going on in here. And that's what Jesus is pointing out. But I want to paint another scenario for you. You have a friend who has nothing going on. They seem healthy as can be. There is no cough, no anything. They go in for a normal well checkup, and the doctor said some blood work came back kind of weird. I want to send you to a specialist. And back comes the news from the specialist, from the oncologist. Your lungs are full of cancer. And we probably know people that's happened to. Now let me ask you, is the second one better than the first? Because... He doesn't have a cough. The second one is no better. 
In fact, you could almost argue better to have the cough. You might catch it earlier, right? Better to have the cough. And there's a sense in which hiding and stifling our sin and keeping it all inside and thinking we're righteous. We look at our neighbors and we say, how, how could they be going to hell? They're so nice. They're so sweet. And I, I can't imagine them ever committing something like sexual immorality. How could they go to hell? Because there's a cancer inside of them. And they may not have the symptoms on the outside but they've got the cancer on the inside. And there's a sense in which many of those people say, I'm righteous before God because I have met this standard. I've met it. And those people stand before God thinking they're righteous in their unrighteousness because they've never dealt with the cancer that's inside of them. And sometimes it's better when someone, uh, we've seen people who have just this mess of a life and they come to the end of themselves, and God brings them to the end of themselves and, and draws them to himself, and we go, what a miraculous thing. It is miraculous when God brings anyone to himself because that cancer is the same, that sin is the same in every individual on earth. We all have the same disease, and there's only one cure, and it's our Lord Jesus Christ the problem we must understand is what's going on in the external is just a symptom of what's in here, of the problems we have in here. And, and that, that makes what Jesus says next so interesting to me. This is so interesting. Let's look at the application Jesus gives in verses 29 and 30. But if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. I guess you throw it with your left hand. I thought that was funny. For it is better for you, <laughs> for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What is Jesus saying here? And I've seen a lot of interpretations, heard a lot of interpretations. I'm going to give you three things that I think we, need, we must draw out of this, these last two verses. First of all, coveting, lust, is so serious that it's worthy of sending us to hell. It's so serious, it's such a serious crime that we deserve hell for it. That, that's important that the one who covets, the one who lusts, they've never done anything at the external level, but they've done it at the heart, they're on their way to hell for it. It's a crime worthy of death, spiritual death, and eternal torment forever. That's point number one, very serious, very serious. Point number two, it is so serious that we must be willing to give up what is most important to us to rid ourselves of it. And this is probably the most important, more, or most common, I would say, interpretation. I believe it's a valid one. It's the most common interpretation of this is that, that we need to understand that we must be willing to give up what is most important to us to rid ourselves of sin. The right eye, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe it's shooting, right, Doug? I mean, yeah, maybe that's what it is. You need the right eye to scope, you know? The right eye... <laughs> is the most important one to the Jew. Now, I know how the right hand may be. Now, you lefties out there saying, no, no, the left hand's more important. But for the majority of us, the right hand's more important. You, take, I can't, you can't read my writing with my right hand. You don't want to see it with my left. You know, I don't want to lose either one of these. But if you give me a choice, you say, you are going to lose one, then I'll lose this one before I lose this one. I can still throw not as good as I used to. My shoulder's not very good. But I can still do a lot of things with one hand, with my right hand, that I couldn't have. The right is more important. For the Jew, that was the case too. The right eye, the right hand, was more important. It was the most important. Let me tell you that you will never conquer sin at the heart level if you love something else more than you hate your sin. You'll never 
conquer sin. Life dominating sin in your life if you love something else more than you hate your sin. It's impossible. If you love something else more than you hate your sin, you will not get out of that sin. Whatever the sin is, in order as a Christian to battle sin, we must be willing to give up anything. Anything. I'd give anything to be done with a sin. And I think sometimes we've said things like that. But then maybe a pastor comes along and says, maybe it's time you cut the internet off. And all God's people said, not a chance. <laughs> right? That's radical. Maybe it's time you throw your television out. Or at least unplug it. Right? And put it someplace where you can't see it. Maybe it's time you throw your phone away. Maybe it's time you get rid of the iPad you know, or the computer. You say, no, we need those things to function in life, don't we? Yeah, I need my right hand, too. You call me radical? Call me some independent fundamentalist Baptist pastor? By the way, that might fit to some degree. Not by the label, but by who I am. But the reality is, I've not asked you to cut your hand off or pluck your eye out. Jesus did that. Am I radical? Maybe according to the world's standards, but according to God's standards, I haven't even scratched the surface yet and telling what you might need to throw out what you might need to toss from you. He said, throw the hand, toss it from you. Get rid of it. Cut it out. Whatever makes us stumble. Look, if you have to find a new job, find a new job. Nothing's worth holding on to and living in unrighteousness. Nothing is. I promise you that. We have come to the place in American Christianity where righteousness means nothing to us where we wouldn't give up anything for righteousness. And look, I know people say, don't be a legalist. We don't want to be a legalist. I'm not talking about legalism, church. I'm talking about a devotion to God, a devotion to Christ, a love for Christ. Do you love him? Or do you love your other things more? Do you love what causes you to stumble more than you love him? It's time to be honest with each other, right? It's time to be honest with myself. And more importantly, maybe be honest with God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us all from righteousness. If we don't love him enough, that's a great confession to make. God, I don't love you enough. Because if I did, I'd cast some things from me. But I love those things more than you, God. What a great confession to make. I believe God would honor that confession and give you more strength and help. I honestly do. I really do. But the third application, I think, is really what Jesus is driving at. I think those are valid, okay? Those are valid. But we need to think a little more deeply because let me ask you something. If my eye offends me, if it causes me to stumble, causes me to sin, and so I say, okay, then, gone. Okay, then it's going to be my left, right? Because my left is pretty soon I'm blind, right? And my hand... It's going to be my right, and then my, hand, my left will find a way to offend, and it'll be my feet, my legs, and my head, and my heart, right? And by the way, if I did those things, would that help me avoid hell? <laughs> would that keep me from hell? No, I've already sinned. <laughs> Let me tell you, for everyone in here, it's too late. It's too late. You, you've gone past, you've already sinned. You cannot be righteous. The standard's so high, it's too late for you all. You can't attain to it. Cutting your hand off, plucking your eye out will not bring you to heaven. It will not cause you to escape hell. You know what you need? In my flesh, no good thing dwells, right? You know what I need? I need to die. I need to die. You say, is this where the Kool-Aid comes out, Pastor? <laughs> no. <laughs> Turn to Romans 6. This is where theology comes in and sound doctrine. Romans chapter 6. Paul writes here to the Christians, to you. 
And here's what he says. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? He predicts this. He's, he's talked about the grace of God and how wonderful and matchless it is and how it covers every sin. But he knows some people will say, well then, if I want God's grace to be big, all I need to do is sin more. God gets glory, and I get to sin. Isn't that wonderful? I get to do my own thing, and God gets more grace. Isn't that great? No. Certainly not. Absolutely not. No way. No. Why? Verse 2. May it never be. Look at this. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, listen, our old man was crucified with him in order that our right eye, our right hand, our mind, our heart, our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died has been justified from sin. Church, we need to die. We need to die. All of us need to die in Christ. The penalty for sin, the wages of sin, is death. The soul that sins, it shall die. You need to die. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So, that, so what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's not enough to give your eye up. It's not enough to give your hand up. You have to die completely. And Christ came and died for you. He died in your stead. If you are in Christ, he died for you. So there's two applications out of this. Two responses out of this. First, Jesus has set the standard of righteousness. And I'm pretty confident that everyone in here would say, I don't meet the standard. Go back to last week, call somebody a fool. I failed yesterday. I confessed that to some friends last night, that I sinned. Some guy did something I didn't, wasn't pleased with, and I had a name for him in my head. An idiot. And that was not right. I didn't say it to him out loud. I said it in my head. It was sin. And I know we say, well, that's minor sin. It might be a lesser commandment, but Jesus said, you don't annul the least. I'm so full of sin. Why did I get angry about that? It was stupid of me. Sin, we don't meet the standard. None of us have attained it. But Jesus offers his righteousness to you. And by not attaining it, by understanding that you don't attain it, what you need to become is poor in spirit. Recognize your poverty in spirit because it's those who are poor in spirit who are blessed who shall inherit the kingdom of God. And you ought to mourn your poverty in spirit because blessed are those who mourn for they shall be satisfied. And you ought to humble yourself before God and get low before him because blessed are the lowly for they shall inherit the earth. 
And you ought to begin to hunger and thirst for some righteousness because you don't have it. And you ought to hunger and thirst that, that, that he might not bring the standard down, but bring you up to the standard in Christ. Because blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And you ought to beg for mercy from God that he might give you that righteousness because blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy, right? And by the way, God will make you pure in heart. Don't we need to be pure in heart? Blessed are the pure in heart. Because if I'm committing adultery of the heart, I'm definitely not pure in heart, am I? Well, he needs to make me pure in heart. I need to be seen as pure in heart because that's the righteous standard. In fact, last week, I didn't go there, but blessed are the peacemakers. And what did Jesus call us to? To go make peace with our brothers and our sisters. You see how these beatitudes are being fleshed out? And they're the law. They're the law that we don't meet, but Christ meets. And Christ offers and says, I'll meet the law on your behalf. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, who, who feel that they don't meet the standard. And guess what? I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. You can rest from all your works because your works aren't going to get you there. You can stop jumping and trying to reach a standard and rest because I meet it for you. In my death of the cross, I pay your penalty. In my plea to you, if you are not in Christ, if you are not, if you do not have the imputed righteousness of Christ, if you don't stand righteous before God in Christ, do so today. Come to him today. Do not delay. I know I say this many weeks. You don't know if you have tomorrow. And you say, well, I had tomorrow last week. By the way, Hebrews would teach you, if you harden your heart against this plea, that eventually the day may come where your heart will be so hard, it'll never affect you, it'll never impact you. Do not harden your heart. Come to him today, plead with him. If you want to talk more about that, I'd be more than happy to. But the second response is this, and I said I'd tie this all together, because for the Christian, these sins of anger that we talked about last week, the sin of lust, I think these are two of the most besetting sins in a person's life as a Christian. I really do. I know they are for me. I know they have been for me. For, I've been a Christian since I was five or six years old, and I have struggled with both of these. And I still struggle to some degree with both of these, a lesser degree than I did at one point, but I'm not going to tell you I've, I've had victory completely over both of them. I wish I could, but I can't. These, these can be life-dominating sins, life-dominating sins that, that cause us to, to just not live for Christ, that cause us to live a defeated life, life instead of a victorious life. And I want to give you hope this morning. I want to give you hope. I don't want to leave you saying, I'm never going to conquer. I'm not enough. You're right, you're not enough. You never were enough. <laughs> it's only Christ that's enough. But I want to give you hope. I want to give you hope this morning, whether it's anger, whether it's lust, maybe it's both. Remember earlier, talked about Israel, God's people. He chose them, and they didn't deserve it, right? He chose Abram. They didn't deserve it. And they weren't deserving of it, so that's point number two. They would have recognized they weren't deserving of it, and he redeemed them out of slavery, right? Remember? So they're standing on the edge of the promised land, but he redeemed them out of slavery, and he gives them the law, right? At the beginning of the 40 years, at the end of 40 years, he gives them the law, which is a law of love, do this and it'll go well with you. Number five, the only logical response to that is to love God and be devoted to him. So what about us? Does God not choose Christians, elect them, predestine them before the foundation of the world? For those of you who are in Christ, God chose you. And when he chose you, know this, when he chose you, he knew everything about you. <laughs> And he chose you anyway. He chose you anyway. He knew it all. He knew what a failure you were, how even after you were Christian, you'd continue to fail, and he chose you anyway. Not because you deserved it. You didn't. But because he set his affection on you. He set his love on you. And then Christ 
demonstrates the love of God at the cross. When's the last time you dwelt on the cross? When's the last time you looked at him suffering and dying and taking your penalty? When's the last time you saw the love in his eyes for you as he was beaten and tortured for you? When's the last time you dwelt on Christ and his love for you? He's chosen you and given you his righteousness. And now his call to you is live righteous. Live according to my commands. Because it's a law of love for you. I love you. That's why I've given you all of this. And I've given you my righteousness and I've given you my law to obey because it is righteousness, because it's good for you. The only logical response to that is to be wholly devoted to him, to be fully committed to him, to let nothing stand in your way of trying to be according to his righteous standard. There's no other logical conclusion if God has done this in your life. And I plead with you, church, God's desire for us is to be holy and righteous before him. Let's not continue in sin that grace may abound. Let's recognize we died to sin. By the love of Christ, we have died to sin. By his grace and his mercy and his love. And if you have trouble with life-dominating sin, whether it's anger, lust, or any other sin, the solution is not in bucking up and doing better. The solution is to look at Christ on the cross and remember God's love for you and his grace for you. And let that change your heart. And let that help you to hate your sin more because look what your sin did to Christ. And love him more deeply. And love his righteousness more deeply. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Let us bask in it all week. In Jesus' name, amen.